Okay, there we go. We're all set now. Hopefully this all works. So um, you should have your It's Learning page open. There's the quiz there. Uh, it says Lecture 1, uh, Darwin on it. Uh, go ahead and open that up, and if you follow along, it's going to be everything we're talking about right here as we go. So let's dive in here. Um, this, is, this is, without a doubt, my favorite unit to talk about. I think this is the most, probably one of the most interesting things that we do discuss uh, throughout the entire year. Um, it's also a really important part of biology. Like, you could make the case that this basically is biology. Um, and it's never been as important as it is right now to understand how this stuff works, especially uh, when we're dealing with things like the coronavirus. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit about this stuff uh, kind of as we go. Uh, and I know when I put the word evolution up there, like uh, sometimes folks get a little bit like, oh, geez, are we going to talk about this, you know? Um, yes, this is an, a very essential part of biology. It's a very essential part of science. Um, but I, I will say this to you, uh, at, at no point that I'm talking to you throughout this entire unit will I ask you to question your beliefs or tell you you have to believe something other than what you personally believe. But this is a science class, and we will talk about science, and this very much definitely is science. This, like I just said, this is, essentially this is biology. Um, if you take a biology course and they don't talk to you about evolutionary theory, uh, I don't know what you just studied, but you didn't study biology. There, there's no doubt. Um, you can yeah, go ahead and ask any, any professor at any major university. Uh, they will pretty much tell you the same thing. Okay? So let's dive in here. I kind of want to explain to you a little bit. Today is mostly about this guy named Darwin. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about him. But let's, let's, let's start off here with just a quick definition. And you guys are welcome to jotting this down if you like, if you want to take notes. Um, a lot of my test comes right off of this. So if you kind of understand what we're talking about here, you pretty much have like the test laid out. So uh, let's dive in here with the actual theory. I want to give you a little bit of background. Uh, you've heard the words theory of evolution before. Uh, how do we define that? Okay. Uh, one way to define it is a gradual change in species through adaptations over time. There's some key words here that I am going to keep coming back to over and over again. It's subtle, but it's important. Notice the word species up there. Okay? That does not say individuals. That will most certainly be a test question, and, and it will make more sense to you as we go. It's a change in species through adaptations to their environment over time. This is, beyond a shadow of a doubt, one of, if not the most fundamental concept in all of biology, maybe in most of science. Like, it's that fundamental. I know we just got done teaching you the central dogma of biology goes DNA to messenger RNA to protein, right? That is the central dogma of biology. Like that is our fundamental belief system of biology and how it works, right? How all of that plays out in the background, out of all of it, is evolutionary theory. And it's a very powerful theory. It's intertwined with virtually every aspect of biology, whether you want to talk about genetics, Molecular biology, cell biology, virology, right? Pathology. It's part of all those things. So I was reading an article a while back ago, and uh, it was all about what the greatest scientific achievements of all time were. Okay? And I thought for sure, I started reading this article, and it wasn't like a scientific article, it was just somebody's thoughts on it, and they were synthesizing some ideas. But they were talking about what the greatest scientific discoveries were of all time. And right away in my head, probably as most people would think, I was thinking, oh gosh, it's, it's, it's gotta be Einstein's relativity. Like how could it not be, right? And I'm thinking of all this stuff like, you know, quantum mechanics and, and oh, it's, all these other things uh, that are, are coming to mind. Um, and I start reading the article and um, I start to, I, I, I read there, in, in the first one, number one is listed as heliocentrism. Do you know what heliocentrism is? It's, it's Copernicus's big idea, his theory, that the earth goes around the sun rather than the sun goes around the earth. <laughs> it wasn't even on my list because it's like, yeah, duh, right? But uh, it's, it's huge. 
because it revolutionized our entire understanding of the universe, right? Like that was a big step for humanity to recognize that the earth isn't the center of the universe. Throughout the history of science, like we have gone from thinking that no matter what it is, if it relates to humans, it's the most important thing ever. Now we're pretty important. I mean, I feel like I'm pretty important anyway. I don't know how you feel about yourself, but in reality, against the background of the cosmos, we are a speck. And it, took, it was a major mental leap to recognize or to even accept that the earth was orbiting the sun and it wasn't the other way around. Because people were like, we are the center of the universe and everything had ought to go around us. That's a huge one, right? So I'm thinking, okay, well, Einstein's got to be number two. Nope. Number two on the list, number two on the list was actually Darwin's theory. And, and I was kind of shocked by that. I was like a little bit surprised. Um, and as I read it, the, the explanation for why this, this individual was saying that, you know, the number two probably most important discovery of all time was evolution um, had to do with the fact that it's easy to understand and it has profound ramifications for how we understand life and understand biology and, and pretty much all the sciences. And, and it's true. When, when you put evolution or even Copernicus's theory up against something like special relativity or general relativity or thermodynamics, like the average person can kind of grab a piece of it and understand it a little bit, okay? And, and it's not too hard to understand, which is nice for us in here, but it also causes issues with folks, I think, in their personal beliefs. Because if you understood more about, say, relativity, which is a very difficult topic, you might find that it conflicts with some of your beliefs as well. If you understood more about thermodynamics, you might find it conflicts with some of your beliefs as well. Or cell theory, or virtually any other science, science realm that we have. It's just that those are hard to access. This is really accessible. So people do know something about it. Like it, intrinsically, it, it, it's, it, it makes sense and it's easy to grasp. And so that's what the article was talking about. And so kind of keep that in mind as we're going through this stuff is, it really isn't that hard to get a hold of. To understand the full ramifications of actually how it works, like that's, that's the bigger picture that we're kind of after. Okay? But this is really intertwined with everything that we do in here. If, if you paid attention in this unit, you're gonna, I guarantee you you're going to recognize, you're going to be like, oh, that's why we learned about that piece when we were doing cell organelles. That's why we learned about that piece while we were doing genetics. That's why we learned about that piece in molecular. Like all of those chunks come together in this unit. And then you're gonna see it kind of as a thread throughout the rest of everything we study in here. I guarantee you, it, it, is, it is interwoven into everything we talk about in here. Um, but let's dive in here with uh, the old man himself, Scary Santa, Chucky D. Old Charles Darwin. So he was born in 1809 actually on the same day as Abe Lincoln. So, dude's old, right? This theory is old. It's been around for a really long time. Yeah, he is kind of scary. He does look like, like, kind of like a scary Santa, doesn't he? I guess that was all the, all the style back then, you know, the big beard and sort of, I don't know. But his ideas, and, and, and this is who we attribute this to, so if you're answering the question on your, on your quiz, his ideas formed the basis of our modern theory. We attribute it to Darwin. True, there were other people around at the time who had similar ideas. Darwin's the guy that put it all together. And, and what we're going to do today is we're going to try and walk through some of his thought process and where the ideas came from. So this is a little historical, but I think to really grasp the idea that he had, you have to understand where it came from. Right? We, we all know that it caused a lot of uh, questioning and a lot of confusion and a lot of controversy, obviously, right? Um, but so, so how did he come up with this idea? And believe me, he was scared to buck the system. He was. Uh, he spent a long time before he actually published. He almost got scooped. So uh, he proposed, what he proposed, and this is real simple, is that species, different species, you know what those are, originate through a process called natural selection. So his, his big idea, if you will, is this thing called natural selection. So forget about the whole idea of evolution and all this stuff, because that word has connotations in your mind. 
And just think about this concept of nature selecting. That, that's really fundamentally where he came. Um, and guys, feel free to ask questions. Like, I love talking about this stuff. Ask me questions if you have any, please, absolutely. So let's talk a little bit about Darwin's big voyage. Like, this is some famous historical fact here. In 1831, he was able to get on board as a naturalist on the HMS Beagle. That's the name of the boat, okay, famous boat. He traveled around the world for five years. So I think kind of in, in the history of Darwin, uh, he, was, he was a naturalist. He was a man after my own heart. I love nature. I, I absolutely love being outside. I love studying everything about birds and insects and rocks and fossils and basically everything in nature. Like that, that's my jam. I love that stuff. And so I can relate to Darwin. He was fascinated with things like beetles, fascinated with fossils, just absolutely loved the nat natural world. And kind of at the time, I don't think he was going very far. Like <laughs> He was a very intelligent guy. His father was, was quite intelligent, quite famous. Um, he, he really was, didn't have, wasn't on track to do anything. And I think they kind of were like, hey, Darwin, this, uh, this position's come up on this boat. Uh, they need a naturalist. They need somebody to document all the new and crazy and weird stuff they find on this giant voyage that they're going to go around the world. And they're like, why don't you get on there, Darwin, and kind of do something with yourself, you know? And, and he did. He jumped on board this boat. Uh, I don't think he was much of a seafarer. I think he struggled with it. Um, but he visited all these strange lands that nobody from England had ever seen before, right? Um, while he was there, he did things like researching the beetles and the finches, which are the birds that he saw, okay? Uh, as he left, let's just kind of trace out his, his route here. Uh, so he leaves England here, up here in Europe, and he, he travels down around the coast of South America, and these dots are the stops. Okay. The Galapagos Islands is one of the most famous places he stops. But all along the way, he is talking to local native people. He's collecting fossils. He's collecting bird specimens. Like they were having a heck of a time out there. They'd go on land and they'd shoot birds. They'd bring them back to the boat and stuff them. Darwin would collect beetles. Darwin is so obsessed with beetles, it's, 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 almost, it's, it's almost bizarre. Okay, I, I can understand this. Darwin loved beetles so much that Darwin was once said to have been next to a tree and saw a beetle on it. And it was a beetle that he hadn't seen before and was very excited about. Well, he had already picked up a beetle in one hand. This is before plastic bags, right? Picked up a beetle in the other hand. So both hands were full with beetles. But he's got this new beetle that's on this tree that he really, oh, he really wants this beetle because he wants to take it back and study it and understand it and catalog it. And so what does Darwin do? Well, he pops one beetle in his mouth and grabs it with his other hand. So now he's got all three beetles and heads back. So like that's how dedicated this guy was to studying nature. Like can you imagine popping a beetle in your mouth? Ooh, right? right? When I was a kid, I loved snakes. I absolutely, I still love snakes. I would spend days outside hunting snakes. I would just go out in the woods and I would flip over every board and every rock until I found every snake in the woods that I could find. And a lot of times I didn't have a bag. So what would turn out would be that if I happened to be wearing a long sleeve shirt, I would tuck it in to my waist and I would start dumping snakes down my shirt. So that when I got home and got off my bicycle and started walking in the house, my mom would freak out. Like I kid you not, like she would lose her mind because I would be standing there and snakes would be crawling out my neck. They'd be crawling out my arms. They'd be going down my pant legs. And I'd be screaming at my mom, Mom, I'll get my aquarium. I've got snakes. <laughs> my mom put up with an awful lot, let me tell you what. And I only ever lost a few in the house. She doesn't know about that, though. So don't let her know that. But yeah, I mean, like, I understand Darwin. I understand that, like, he really liked nature. Because I'm there, too. I, I, I love it, too. I love exploring, understanding stuff. So he travels around the coast of South America, okay, stops at these famous islands where he just learns some amazing things about the tortoises, about the finches there, okay? And then heads back around, look, he also stops in New Zealand, stops in Australia here, um, and then they head back around the coast of Africa and then back home to Europe. Now, back home in England, Darwin had spent a lot of time studying nature. Um, and one of his things he was interested in was geology, 
make the history of the earth. And this is at the time when geology is a young field. It's just starting out. We're just starting to understand that there's layers of history buried under the earth. And there's a way to understand the sequence that they're in. So this is all just happening. Um, things we take for granted today. He's also really interested in the selective breeding of plants and animals. He wants to know why people can breed certain pigeons together and get some really weird looking pigeon. He's interested in that. He wants to know why, you, why people breeders around are breeding certain dogs together and basically creating a really weird looking dog. And because that's what people are doing. People are still doing that today, right? And so all these thoughts are rambling around in Darwin's head while he's on board the Beagle. So one of the things, and I want to take you through some of the things that Darwin actually saw and noticed. And this is the first one. He noticed that distantly related species sometimes develop similarities if the environment was the same. Now let me tell you about these birds here. Everybody recognize these are birds. The ostrich in Africa, the rea in South America, and the emu in Australia. Okay. He, he sees some of these birds. And he recognizes that they can't be descended from each other. In other words, they're not closely related. If you're working on the quiz there. They're not closely related. In other words, these things, none of these birds can fly. They're huge. They look like dinosaurs. They're all descended from other ancestors on, this, on their specific continent that used to be able to fly. Now you look at these three birds together, and if you're thinking in terms of evolution, in your mind, you're already probably going, well, those guys must share some common ancestry. Like, they must be related. They're not. They are on continents that are so far apart, Africa, South America, Australia, that, that like, and they can't fly. <laughs> so an emu didn't swim to South America, or an ostrich didn't swim to Australia, right? So in his mind, he's going, how do you get something that looks so similar on a totally different landmass? Like, how the heck does that happen? And, and now we know it's a process called convergent evolution, where they converge on similar characteristics, even though they, they, they are not closely related. Now, I know they're all birds, but the the emus related to something that can fly, that, used to, that flew in Australia. The ray is related to something that could fly in South America. The ostrich is related to something that could fly in Africa. So they each develop this weird body shape separately from each other because the environment was the same. And Darwin asked the question, because he wondered, why isn't there one of these monsters in North America? Why don't we have one here in America? He knew there wasn't one. Like, wh why? And the answer is very simple to us today. Because one of the, you needed something that was, had potential to develop these characteristics in each of these environments. And, and we didn't have that here. So it didn't develop. It's, it's, it's interesting, right? So he's asking these questions as he goes along. So if you've never seen these birds before, um, I'd like to kind of give you a little quick, uh, here of, uh, of a couple of these here. I think I've got, this is the emu and here's the ostrich. So if you've never seen one before, take a look here. Maybe we can turn that up.
that's probably enough of that. Anyway, what I hope you see there is just how similar those birds look. It's astounding that they're not related. It should be shocking. It shocked Darwin because he recognized there's no way they could be related. Now let's look at another piece of evidence, another piece of information that Darwin picked up on his journey. So he's on the Galapagos Islands and it's famous, the tortoises there are absolutely famous. Okay, these humongous tortoises live on each of these islands. And what Darwin noticed in this location was that the reverse could happen as well. You could have a bunch of very closely related species that look different. So this is the reverse scenario. These things are all related to a common ancestor. They are closely related, the tortoises here, and look at how different their shells look. They're, and at first he didn't know, he didn't catch this. But he was collecting these things. They were eating them, actually, on board the boat. <laughs> you think about it, they're sailing around the world. you got to eat something, so tortoise is as good as anything else. Uh, but they're saving the shells because they're just so astounded at how big these giant tortoises are. They've never seen anything like this. And he's got these shells on the boat, and he gets to talking to some of the natives that live on these islands, and he realizes that they can tell him which island the shell came from just by looking at the shell. They, already, they knew, they're like, oh yeah, that, that came from uh, James Island or whatever. And he was kind of shocked by that. And that's when he's kind of started to look into the fact that, you know, all these different tortoises must be related to a common ancestor. So they diverged from some similar looking thing and became different because their environments were slightly different. What they were eating on the islands was slightly different. Um, and so how did they get between the islands? Probably on log rafts and things like that during storms is probably how that actually happened. But he recognized that these are closely related species that became slightly different because their environments were different. You see the two different things there? So divergent evolution versus convergent, which we'll come back to later on. Okay. Another thing that Darwin found was the glyptodont. Now, this is one heck of a creature here, right? In, in South America, he found this fossil. The native peoples actually showed it to him. And Darwin recognized immediately that this looked just like something else he knew about. Do you see the resemblance to the armadillo? Like, it's shocking. Like, that is basically a gigantic, like, scary, oversized armadillo is what that is. The difference is the glyptodont's extinct. It doesn't exist anymore. It didn't exist in Darwin's day. It doesn't exist now. He just found the fossils. Okay. So he noticed some fossils of extinct animals were similar to living species. Do you see how Darwin's thinking is kind of rolling now? One of the things, and I'll tell you this, because we probably won't have much time to really get into it, evolutionary change, like, like as organisms change through time, one of the things that is very easily changed because of the way genetics works it happens to be size. So a lot of other characteristics of an organism may not change much, but sometimes size can be a very big, a very quick changing factor characteristic about a population. And for the glyptodont, like it's, it's pretty shocking. Um, later on, we're gonna look at things like horses. Oh my goodness, horses have changed dramatically in geological time. The most ancient horse fossils we have are about the size of a dog. Like imagine a mini horse. Be so cute, right? You put a little monkey on it, let it ride around or something. And they've changed a lot. Their toe shape has changed a lot until we have these gigantic creatures that are around today. They don't always get bigger, they don't always get smaller. It depends on what's going on in the environment. But, but size is, is kind of a thing that does change a lot geologically. Um, I want to read to you here something Darwin said when he found this fossil because it, I think it really brings home his whole idea in. in and where it hit him when he saw this fossil. Because he knew he was onto something. He just wasn't quite sure what yet. And this is from Darwin. He says, this wonderful relationship in the same continent, which happened to be South America, between the dead and the living, the glyptodont and the armadillo, will I do not doubt hereafter throw more light on the appearance of organic beings on our earth and their disappearance from it than any other class of facts. Darwin knew this was a big deal. He just couldn't put it together yet. He knew something was going on here. He was on to something. So 
Um, when Darwin returns back to England, I kind of cut his voyage short there, uh, his specimens blew the scientific community away. He was, for a short time, he was the most popular person around. They wanted to hear everything about the weird native peoples that Darwin had experienced. They wanted to know everything about what a giant tortoise tasted like. They wanted to know like everything about like what the weird birds were that he saw, what the weird insects were. He was like, imagine a time before YouTube, a time before the internet, when all the information you had of the outside world came from word of mouth. So Darwin comes back and he is suddenly like Mr. Popular. Everybody wants him at their dinner party. Everybody wants to chat him up. Everybody wants to like be near him because he's got all this really cool stuff he brought back. Um, so the specimens he brought back and showed the scientists of the day, it blew them away. Like most of these things are found nowhere else in the world because he had just traveled around the entire world. Um, many of the birds that Darwin had picked up and thought were different species were actually all finches. And the ornithologist of the day immediately identified them as finches for Darwin. And that really spurred Darwin off, okay? Because what Darwin figured out was that all those birds that he thought were different species, like say sparrows and um, or different groups, families of birds, I should say, like different sparrows, um, you know, different nuthatches, like that sort of thing. They were all finches. And they really somewhat, in, in some way, all resembled the mainland South American finch. So he starts to think about this idea that maybe species aren't fixed in time. And maybe there could be a natural process whereby things change through time. Up until this point in, in the world, in the scientific community, everybody thought that whatever organisms were on our planet were the exact same organisms that had ever been here. Like no, no new organisms could ever come about, right? They accepted that some things, you know, went extinct, but they didn't think anything new could ever happen. Just think that through for a second here. If extinction has been happening, over the past, well, now we know hundreds of millions of years, billions of years, um, if you keep removing organisms, eventually there ain't going to be none left. You're going to run out, right? So where are all these new organisms coming from? You end up with a real difficult paradox there, right? But Darwin starts to realize maybe things don't stay the same forever. Maybe they do change kind of through time. And, and so you can see where, where he's going with all this, right? And here's his finches, just because it's kind of famous. Let's just take a gander at his finches. So all of these different finches, Darwin had screwed up and identified. Like he identified this one as a woodpecker. This one as a warbler, right? Um, I don't know what some of these others were, but he, he identified them incorrectly. And the ornithologist was like, no, Darwin, those are all finches based on their characteristics. And so Darwin noticed that they were similar in some ways to the one on the mainland. And if you looked at the individual birds and the islands that they happen to live on, you get this really beautiful picture of what we call adaptive radiation, where a bird from the mainland species lands and colonizes individual islands, but the food sources on the islands are so different that over time, the bird adapts to that. And, and the species changes so that their beaks are real weird. Like the woodpecker, it's got a beak for pecking here. It's a finch, but it can peck like a woodpecker. Um, the, the tree finch, totally different looking beak, probably for cracking seeds, right? You've got some things that look more crow beak-like because there were different things that they were eating in their environment. Are they crushing, eating seeds? Are they eating fruit? Are they eating insects? Are they cactus eaters, right? There is even one that... Uh, I think there was a, when they ate blood or something like that, there's some real weird ones he discovered. Okay, so that's adaptive radiation. That is divergent, spread, coming different from a similar ancestor. And that was a big deal. Now, what else is going on for Darwin? Well, let's talk about geology here. Okay, there's a picture of myself and my lovely wife at the bottom of the Grand Canyon. Has anybody been to the Grand Canyon? It's fantastic, isn't it? 
It's one of the coolest places in, in North America. And it's not that far away. If you ever get the opportunity to drive there or go there, go there. It's a really neat place. So I've got a buddy who actually runs a rafting business down there. And he called me up one day and he's like, hey, got a couple extra slots on this raft. Do you want to come to the Grand Canyon and raft the entire Grand Canyon? And oh yeah, I did. And it was awesome. Oh my gosh. We went down the canyon in a raft from like top to bottom, the whole thing. And, and it, just to go through all those pages of Earth's history in the, the rapids, I almost drowned at least twice. Uh, and I'm not being like <laughs> over exaggerating there. Like I was underwater for that long that I thought it was game over. Like we went over waterfalls. It was crazy. Um, this is a very tame section of the river right here that you're looking at. Uh, but it was a load of fun. Uh, and especially for me, I got to see, look at these layers of rock. We're going down millions, and at the bottom, we're back billions of years in Earth's history. It's astounding, and it's really interesting. Well, let's go back to Darwin here, because at the time of Darwin, most Europeans believed that the Earth was only a few thousand years old. Now, to any of us that understand geology, that's pretty laughable now. Like, there's just no, no chance. There's no way, right? But these two guys... Uh, Hutton and, and Lyle uh, really were kind of pushing the idea that Earth was extremely old, and they had an awful lot of evidence for that. One of the most uh, famous statements uh, is kind of known as uniformitarianism, is that the same processes that changed Earth in the past are, are the same ones that are operating now in the present. So, in other words, if you want to know how a rock forms that's made out of sand, look at a beach. Okay. If you want to know how a rock forms that has cracks in it, look at how mud cracks form today on our surface. Right? You, you, you couldn't just postulate some giant cataclysm like a big flood that made this giant like, hole in the earth right here. Like, you look at things that are going on today. Um, and that's how we kind of understand you know, how are rivers cutting through bedrock today. We go look at Niagara Falls. Niagara Falls is receding very rapidly. It's a relative new feature. Like, it's cutting back. I don't know how many feet a year. Like it's cutting a hole in the earth as it goes backwards. Right? So we can see that happening today and we can measure some rates and kind of have a little bit of an understanding of all of that. But anyway, Darwin's reading their books kind of as he goes on the Beagle. Somebody gave him a copy um, of these and he's reading, I think, Hutton's work. And Hutton's talking about things like, you know, earthquakes and how earthquakes can shift rock. Like, nobody had thought about this stuff. Now, today, we understand earthquakes really well, right? So, as Darwin's going along, he's reading all this stuff, and he's coming to the understanding that Earth must be really old. In fact, I mean, he was in South America at the time, or maybe Africa, he's in one of those continents, uh, when there was a huge earthquake. Okay, so he's, he's up on land, he's exploring. He actually went up, it must have been South America, he went up into the mountains, and he found seashells at the top of the mountain, fossil shells. Okay. He's thousands of feet up above sea level, and he finds fossil shells. It's not shocking to us today, but to Darwin, he's like, how in the heck did these shells get on top of this mountain? Right? Well, Lyle and Hutton had some ideas about that. So he's coming back down from the mountain, and, and he's not back on board the ship yet. And there is an earthquake, the likes of which Darwin has never experienced. It throws him on the ground. He thinks he's dying. Like, the entire earth is shaking. You live in Indiana, so you've never experienced this before. Uh, he's convinced the world is ending. The whole earth upheaves and shifts. And he gets back to the boat, and they look at the water line from high tide, like where it used to be, and it's now 10 feet out of the water, higher than where it was. Like, the ground lifted up 10 feet into the air and stayed there. So Darwin's like, oh my gosh, if that can happen in one instant, like, over the course of thousands, millions, billions of years, couldn't you take the ocean floor and slowly lift it higher and higher and higher, 10 feet, 5 feet at a time, until seashells are 1,000 feet above sea level? And that's exactly what happened, right? But for his time, that was a shocker. Like, this is all new stuff, right? So that was part of Darwin's big... Uh, big realization there was that this stuff actually happened. Now, this is a picture right here that I took. This is Silfra Fisher. Uh, it's in Iceland. And 
what you're looking at here on the left and on the right are the two sides of the mid-ocean ridge. This is growing by like something like four centimeters or so a year as the Earth's plates, because now we know about this thing called plate tectonics that they didn't know about, move apart. And that's where they're moving apart. Check that out. That's getting wider. Isn't that crazy? Iceland is getting larger from the inside out because it keeps spreading apart. The middle the mid oceanic ridge cuts right across Iceland. So I went here and I actually had the opportunity to swim in that water. And that's what it looks like underneath there. That's a dry suit. It is so cold because that water is running right off of a glacier and filling that up. It's, it was freezing cold. My face is beat red after being in that thing. But that is a dry suit that I'm in. It was really awesome to swim in the crack between the plates. Think about that, right? But that's what Darwin experienced. So there were some other folks at the time. Um, and I want to kind of introduce you to one of the ideas, just because people still get hung up on this today, and they still get confused by it. And this is the guy, a guy by the name of Lamarck, OK? This is wrong, OK? Don't think this is right. I only want to mention him because I still hear today people spouting this hypothesis. Lamarck was wrong. He was on the right track. He just didn't get it right. That happens in science. So Lamarck's idea was that organisms could change during their lifetimes by using parts of their bodies. And so they'd acquire these traits and they pass them on to their offspring. Wrong, Lamarck. He also thought of this idea of this ladder of evolution. So let me kind of explain that to you. His idea was, how did the giraffe get the long neck? He thought that the mechanism for that was that giraffes just kept reaching for higher and higher leaves. And their necks stretched because they kept reaching. It stretched their neck out, right? Seems to kind of make sense. And then when they reproduced, their babies got to have just a little bit longer necks. So he was, he was kind of on the right track, but he was dead wrong. Today, and with Darwin's theory, we understand that an individual, an individual organism like an individual giraffe, cannot evolve. You could stand on top of a building your whole life and flap your arms and think that you'll evolve flight, and you ain't going to fly, right? You know that. So a giraffe can stand there and stretch its neck all it wants, it ain't going to get any longer. In fact, you could work out your whole life and get big, huge, strong muscles, OK? Have some children. Your children don't just get big, huge, strong muscles, do they? No, they get the DNA that came with you, that you gave them. You don't change your DNA by working out. You don't change your DNA by stretching. You see where I'm going here? So this does not work, this whole idea. So how does it change over time? We'll, we'll get to that. But it has more to do with variations that are already there. There are some genetic differences. There are some giraffes that already have slightly longer necks. Why? Sexual reproduction, the mixing of the genes, right? There are some, I don't know, organisms that already have a little bit more of something than their peers. And if they reproduce, they'll pass that on. So this doesn't happen like this, OK? This is, this is incorrect. And I just want to point that out, because a lot of folks get confused by that. Lamarck was wrong. Now, other things that are going on at the time, uh, I want to mention that Darwin, Darwin needed a mechanism. He, he, understood, he understood that this had happened. By the time he's seen the fossils, he's like, oh, crap. Life is changing through time. There's been enough time, because he studied geology and saw how earthquakes worked, that life could have changed over vast periods. But Darwin is like, how? Just like Lamarck was trying to say how. And he was grappling with how this could occur. And uh, I don't know if he was reading Malthus's population growth ideas here or not, but uh, they did influence him. Okay? So Malthus was a, a famous sociologist. He studied um, human populations and population growth. And he recognized something. Malthus re recognized something. He recognized that humans were being born faster um, than they were dying. Okay, just, just drink this in for a second here. This is way, way back, okay? This is not present day. And he said to himself, if this population growth is unchecked, okay, it's gonna cause us to run out of resources. In other words, there's only so much food. If we keep making babies at the rate that we're doing, this is way back in the day, we're gonna run out, okay? So 
Darwin said to himself, if this is true for humans, like humans could overpopulate an area and not have enough food, how much more so would it be true for something that can't farm and can't produce its own food, like nature? And so he applies this concept to nature and other organisms in nature. And he kind of phrases it like this. Most organisms produce uh, more offspring than can actually survive and go on to continue the species. And that's why we're not overrun by rabbits. Just think about it for a second. It's a picture of a maple tree right there. Okay. Do you see all the whirly birds? You know what those are, little whirly bird things. You ever see those on the ground? You know how many like thousands of those there are right after those if they fall off? Do they all grow into trees? No, we'd be overrun by maple trees, wouldn't we? What happens is that I wipe a whole butt billions of them out with the lawnmower, right? They might try to grow, but I'm wiping them out. Squirrels eat a majority of them, right? Many of them land in the street and you drive over them in your car and crush them into smithereens. Like, we're not overrun with maple trees because all the babies don't survive. And so that's what Darwin sees and he's like, there's the mechanism. That's how it works. He starts to put it together, right? So, an essential piece to this is what Darwin starts to understand about what we call today artificial selection. These are pigeons. Now take a look at these pigeons here for a second. Like these are some seriously ugly pigeons. Like some of those, I, I, like, I don't even understand. Like that one on the top right there, like what in the world is that weird looking thing? Well, back in Darwin's day, and even today, people were all about breeding pigeons. Like you might collect Pokemon today, like back in the day, they collected pigeons. So they bred these pigeons, and what they did was they said, okay, the, the pigeon breeders would be like, hey, this one's got a really like weird looking leg. What if I breed it with that one over there that's got this weird looking head? They, they took the runts, they took the weirdos from the group and bred them together to make something even weirder. So people did this, like the, none of those is a native pigeon. We made those, right? They were making them in Darwin's day. Um, and so Darwin studied this stuff and came to recognize that organisms naturally have variations. There's differences. There are some pigeons born in a clutch of pigeons where some of them will have different colors variations. Some of them will have different leg variations, different beak variations, and it could be subtle. But, an in, but a breeder could select for those, could always grab the one with the longer beak, with the bigger neck feathers, bigger neck feathers, always breed it with another one with bigger neck feathers and over a long enough time, create, sculpt this weird looking critter, right? So those variations get passed down to the babies. Darwin's got his mechanism. Okay, here's another example of artificial selection that you'll recognize. I wanna show you a couple of these. Do you know that modern corn was not always this way? Modern corn comes from a plant called teosinte. The Native Americans made it. We, we, unless you're Native American, you didn't have a role in this. The Native Americans made corn. How did they do it? Look at this little, this crappy little thing right here that they were eating. It's a tiny little kernel-y looking thing. They took that and they bred bigger ones and bigger ones together always. They always planted the seeds from the bigger ones. They ate all the other seeds. They planted the seeds from the bigger ones, the juicier ones, the tastier ones. And over kind of a short amount of time, they made something that we call primitive maize. So that's about somewhere around like in about two to 4,000 year ago range is when this actually developed. How do we know this? It's still around today. You can go to the desert and find Teosinte. You can find where they grew it, where this actually happened. And today we've got modern corn and we're pushing it further because now we genetically engineer our corn. <laughs> However you feel about that, uh, we have pushed modern corn pretty far. Now it's big and huge and juicy and tasty and sweet and yummy. Right? Very different from its ancient relatives. But we did that. We artificially selected for it. But humans were picking the variations that already were there. Did humans put that variation in there? No. Some kernels were just bigger. And humans were like, yeah, give me that. Do you see it? Nature had the variations already. This is artificial selection. Here's one you do know about for sure. Okay. Anybody have one of these weird dogs? Who's got a strange dog? Any Pomeranians? No, any wiener dogs? 
Uh, I, I'm still trying to figure out the wiener dog. That is the weirdest looking thing ever. Like, what is the purpose of that thing? I had a Pomeranian gr growing up. It was a big fluff ball. I used to try and take it out in the woods with me sometimes. It was not suited for walking in the woods. Invariably, I would end up carrying my dog through the wilderness because my dog couldn't keep up. It's a dog. All modern dogs are descended from the wolf. Your dog has ancestry tracing back to the wolf. You might know that. So why is it not a wolf? Because people purposely bred dogs together, wolf together, wolf against wolf, and to select certain traits. What traits do you think people were selecting for? Friendliness most of the time because they didn't want to get eaten. Obedience, right? Those are characteristics they could select for, and they did. So now we have modern dogs that look really weird because now we're selecting for things like, I want one that looks like a foofball. So we make a Pomeranian, right? And people are still doing this stuff. It's, cr it's crazy. It's really neat. But these are how all the dog breeds were created. This happened uh, in a very short amount of time. Humans can modify nature quickly through artificial selection. Okay, that's artificial selection. Now, the takeaway from this, one of the big takeaways today is variation, okay? I don't want you to think of variations as defects. The raw material for evolutionary change is not stretching your neck or making big muscles. It's variations that are already there in nature. So look at these snails. Those are all the same species of Cuban tree snails. Look at how many different colors there are. If for some reason there was an environmental factor that made it better to be red than yellow, guess what? you would suddenly start seeing more red ones than yellow ones. And maybe there would no longer be any yellow ones at some point. So nature provides this raw material for us. It happens because of genetics that we'll study, talk about a little bit later on. It's already there. And I know you look around and you think, uh, has anybody seen like two squirrels before? And you think, those two squirrels look identical. Like there's no way you can tell them apart. Believe me, there is a tremendous amount of genetic variation there. Like rabbits, rabbits have crazy genetic variation. Like on the surface to us humans, it doesn't look like anyone is that different. I guarantee you that a rabbit probably looks at humans and thinks we all look the same, <laughs> if rabbits thought like that. They probably look at us and think we're all identical, like there's nothing different about any of us. But we notice all these little differences about ourselves, right? So Darwin writes this famous book, and the title is, on the origin of species by means of natural selection or the preservation of favored races in the struggle for life. And there's a lot of contention about this title and Darwin went back and forth on it. Um, but I want you to see kind of where, where his idea was kind of going here. Race, not in the sense of uh, how we think of race among humans, but he's talking about groups of different organisms, okay? In other words, nature is selecting and nature is selecting for characteristics that are favored in this great struggle for life. So what's his big idea? Here it is right here. The big leap for Darwin, this is it. This is the whole culmination, everything I'm talking about here, is that he said, okay, there's a natural process that operates just like artificial selection. In fact, we call it natural selection. Do you get it? So instead of people selecting variations, which we call artificial selection, making dogs, making corn. Nature selects characteristics, making red snails, making yellow snails. Okay. And then he went on to understand like how nature operated and how nature did that. But it's just a selective process that nature happens to do. And he called it natural selection. Here's a drawing from Darwin's notebook. It's the most famous drawing. I've seen people with this tattoo. It does, probably doesn't look like much to you, but in biology, this is a very, very famous drawing. So I thought you should see it. Kind of looks like this thing is walking along with two legs down here on the bottom. But what he drew was this giant branching tree of all these different organisms and kind of how they might be related, like which one was related to which one. This is monumental. At the top of his journal, he writes the words, I think. Like, like this was the big idea right here. All of life is related, and it all goes back to variation that already exists in nature selecting for the variations that work the best in certain circumstances. Okay, so I think we covered everything there on the lecture. So is there any questions you guys have, any that we didn't answer? We got through all of them? Okay, good deal.